This is the Stop Time Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hopkins, and I'm here to engage you in thought-provoking motivational conversations around practicing the art of living in the moment. I'm a certified life coach, and I'm excited to dig deep and offer insights into embracing who we are and where we are at. So my, my next guest, Canadian actor Julian Bailey, was discovered during a citywide talent search at his elementary school in Montreal, subsequently cast in a CBC Christmas film special at the age of 11. Um, Bailey would go on to lend his voice to such beloved animated characters as Mowgli in the Jungle Book anime series and Pepito, the bad hat for the original HBO musical specials Madeline. In his later teen years, Julian was granted a scholarship to study at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts West in Pasadena, California. When a gut feeling led him to decline an invitation to join the third year Academy company, Julian chose instead to leave the LA area on a Chicago bound Greyhound bus. Surviving his first job in the Windy City as a bicycle courier and following a brief homeless phase, Julian was cast in a handful of critically acclaimed plays before getting his SAG card, thanks to that old Taft-Hartley rule. Returning to Los Angeles, Julian lived out of his car and auditioned for two years without a booking before deciding to try his hand at stand-up comedy. Following his first performance at the comedy store's belly room, Julian was contacted by an agent, which led to some better opportunities. Occasional TV jobs on shows like NCIS, Just Shoot Me and The Young and the Restless, among others, were supplemented by dressing up in character for weekend birthday parties across SoCal as Pikachu, Scooby-Doo, and a Teletubby, <laughs> among others, as well as going door to door in West Hollywood and Beverly Hills, where Julian would sell gourmet salads and sandwiches out of a portable cooler at a high-end hair salon. Currently a series regular uh, and part of an exquisite cast on Amazon Prime Video's new original series, Three Pines, Julian plays the complex and, and enigmatic yeah. artist, Peter Morrow. Welcome, Julian. It is such a great pleasure to have you here with me today. I'm so happy to be here with you, Lisa. Thank you for having me. It's just awesome. I mean, just to stop and, you know, just literally stop time and, and live in the moment Thanks. with me for a bit. I really appreciate it. All right. So do I. Thank you so yeah. much. So, you know, although we're meeting for the first time today, mm. I learned a lot about you through our email exchanges. Did you really? I really did. What do you think about that? I think that's awesome. <laughs> I'm super curious now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. And I wanted to share this with you. I remarked on, well, here's, here's what three words come to mind. Thoughtful, creative, humble, and actually there's four words, kind. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Thanks. Those are, those are pretty nice words. Yeah. yeah. You came across that way. And, you know, I'll tell you why, you know, part of it was even in how you responded to me asking for your bio, um, mm -hmm. which was unique in its own, you know, um, and I, you, you said to me, and I quote from an email, I included things I thought might be more interesting than just rattling off credits, et cetera, mm -hmm. which I think is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I listened to your podcast with my friend Anna from the show from Three Pines. And uh, I took note of the fact that she had mentioned that she'd lived on a boat in London. And uh, you seem to really appreciate that. So I thought I'll, uh, I'll include some of the, you know, the in-between stuff, which is really most of the stuff, you know, in life and, and in my career so far has been mostly a lot of rejection a lot of struggle a lot of no's and uh a lot of just having to hang in and and make it to the the next job i guess you could say yeah no that's brilliant and it's you know talk oh talk to me about that gut feeling you mentioned right you mentioned in your bio that that i think it it had you leaving la on a chicago bound bus right to chicago talk to me about that gut feeling yeah yeah that was interesting um a couple things happened i graduated from the academy the american academy of dramatic arts in pasadena california so it was the the west coast uh, branch of the school and um i got an invitation to the third year company and i was honored you know to 
to receive that. And I sat on it for a bit and then I accepted, got an apartment lined up for that next year. And uh, something wasn't sitting right with me about the thought of coming back. It's almost as though something hadn't settled in me about the thought of coming back and doing the third year as cool as I thought it would be. I had this voice in the back of my head kind of bouncing around of an old mentor of mine who had talked to me in the past about Chicago before I ever went to California. And he had said, if you want to do theater, Chicago is sort of a, an underrated place that you could go and really stretch your legs creatively and do some cool things. So I remember it was one day I just realized I need to go to Chicago. And I told my girlfriend at the time and uh, she supported me. I didn't have any money though. So as a matter of fact, she helped pay for my Greyhound ticket to get there. I probably had maybe $25 or something like that left in my pocket. And the first night I got to Chicago, I, I slept in the Greyhound station and uh, uh, my grandfather, my mom's dad had actually recently died and he didn't have a lot of money, but he had left me like $600 or something like that. So that 600 bucks somehow wound up in my account a couple of days after I got to Chicago and I was able to kind of get me off on my feet, which, which was sort of meaningful. But yeah, gut feeling. I mean, it just something wasn't, I, I guess you could say I didn't have total peace about it. And, uh, and the idea of going to Chicago and actually following through on, on that sort of itch at the back of my head or in the back of my, my soul, if you will, uh, felt more right to just kind of dive into my career, dive into the world and not be sort of held in by the, the safety of, of my school and guaranteed subscribers coming to watch our plays and all that kind of thing. I just felt like I needed to break out. No, it's super interesting because, you know, you trusted your gut. Where else does that show up in your life where you've, where you've just trusted your gut? Cause it doesn't sound like, I mean, did you also leave your girlfriend behind or did she come with you? No, she stayed behind because she, uh, had a plan and, and followed through on it to go to a, a really great liberal arts college in Massachusetts. And so she moved to uh, uh, Massachusetts and I moved to Chicago and we stayed together. Like we, we stayed in touch and she was tremendous, um, you know, during that time. But eventually, you know, we took a little break, just kind of have a breather. And she met someone and she ended up marrying him. So how was that? <laughs> well, yeah. And I'm not trying to get into your love life. What, what, yeah, I, was no. actually, what I was actually aiming towards, <laughs> it's funny, was and it, it was really interesting that you were willing and, and also that, that she was able to support you, which is sidebar was is pretty amazing. But, right, but yeah. that you were willing to literally leave everything based on a, on a gut feeling and this sort of, you know, memory you said of a mentor sort of saying yeah can you talk to me about the moment before the gut feeling like something must yeah. have been were you feeling complacent were you feeling bored were you feeling unfulfilled like what was it that allowed you to 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 find that to listen to that ping that's a really good question you know i i don't know if i have an answer uh, for that you, you know when when you're going and you're you're studying you're going full speed and then it just stops and then you're like, okay, what am I doing now? And you're still in, I, I was still in LA for that summer. And I was kind of like trying to decide what to do. There is, there's definitely a sense of um, after the thrill is gone kind of thing. And, and just wondering, you know, what am I doing now? That, that space and that time, I guess uh, I was able to take, you know, time to sort of meditate or pray and just kind of feel uh, feel things out as far as, you know, what, what lay ahead. That's kind of just the way I, yeah, the way I would describe it. I don't know. It's just it's just a feeling you have, you know, so I, I've always moved through the world, I think, pretty intuitively. Not that that's always uh, seemed to land me in great spots. But but I think, uh, I don't know if I have a fear, I would say one of my, my fears might be regret. And I think just not acting on something that's scratching at you mm. might, might be the thing that I was sort of, you know, afraid for lack of a better word of, uh, of, uh, of doing is, is, you know, is not doing something. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Super mm. interesting. And you were really young then, right? I mean, that was right at the beginning of your career. Sure. Yeah. I would have been just turned 20 years old. So yeah, it's super interesting. Cause, cause there's that sort of burden of proof that we have, or we seem to feel like we have, um, when we're young, right. 
Okay, yeah. now you've gone there and you've done your school. Now what are you going to do? Okay, you're there. So yeah, where are the gigs? What's going on? Yeah, it's a good question. It, it, the the first my first full day in Chicago, I remember it took us two days to get there. It was like a forty eight hour bus ride because of all the stops and so I, I slept in the Greyhound station my first night and then I walked out into the streets uh near near the Greyhound station and I'm walking uh walking up the street and you know when you kind of trip and and you think you're cool because you're listening to Pearl Jam on your yellow Walkman and uh and this would have been 1997 uh August and uh and I, I sort of tripped I remember tripping on the street kind of like with my toe on the on the the, the little you know, the crack in the sidewalk. Yeah. And, and, and I'm kind of looking around to make sure nobody noticed me, you know, and there's this guy smoking a cigarette across the street and he's just like eagle eyeing me, you know, and uh, he just beelines over to me, you know, flicks his cigarette down, stomps it out, and s steps right up to me. And he's like, Hey kid, he goes, you need a job. And I was like, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, perhaps I may in fact need a job. Yeah. And he's like, you know how to ride a bike? And I was like, yeah, I actually do. <laughs> and so, uh, so he, uh, he said, come with me. So I followed him. I mean, probably not super wise of me, but this is what happened. I followed him into a building and he, we walked into a, a sort of a, a, a ratty little office and takes out another cigarette, lights it up, kicks his feet up on the desk, you know, blows a puff of smoke and just sort of squints his eyes at me and says, uh, so where are you from? And I said, well, I'm originally from Canada, but I moved here from Southern California. And he's like, California. He's like, why, why in the hell would you move here to Chicago? And I was like, well, you know, I'm an actor and I just want to do theater and stuff like that. And he's like, so where are you staying? And I was like, well, for now I'm staying at the Greyhound station. And he said, uh, he said, well, uh, th that's, that's not very sustainable, is it? And I said, probably not. And he said, well, there's a kid who works for me who uh, might be able to help you out. He'll be here in, in about an hour. You can talk to him. So this kid comes in, and he was a bike courier for the company. And, uh, and he said, well, I don't exactly live in, um, I don't remember what he said, Paradise Island or something like that. So I took a bus to where he had told me he lived, and I walked up the street, and I was like, you know, sort of, concern for my life I guess at first and uh and I stayed in a little room that was probably the size of a well a medium-sized closet it was it was a real you know shift and culture shock coming from basically Calabasas California that summer uh to that and uh yeah it was but it was it was cool and and, and then I was doing the bike messenger stuff and yeah. and uh, eventually we got evicted because he wasn't giving the money I was giving him to the landlord. So after about a month, we got evicted. I was homeless, li literally homeless. Like I, I slept under a tree across, like right by the Chicago River one night. And at the time I was going through the trades looking for auditions. Mm. And uh, a friend of mine said, where are you staying? I said, oh, I'm staying across from the Doubletree Hotel. And they said, oh, at the Hyatt. And I said, no, at the single tree, you know, I slept under a little tree. <laughs> It's a stupid joke, but and so that next morning, I I, I remember I I got up and I I went uh, to uh, I called an ad for a play and it was Reservoir Dogs that was auditioning and I I met the lady who was the producer. She was temping in the financial in the I guess what is it the financial district in Chicago. Met her and uh, she said, "Come to this guy's house tonight." So uh, there'll be a reading of the play. I don't know if there'll be part for you, but just come. Where are you staying, by the way? I said, ah. She could probably tell I, I wasn't, you know, mm. bathed or whatever. I hadn't had a shower probably in over a month. I, they had a bath that it was ratty and dirty, and there was a black hose. I'd have to hose myself down with, and I was really going, oh, what am I doing here in Chicago? So I went that night to a friend of hers house, and he was hosting this reading for Reservoir Dogs, the play. And this guy was from Las Vegas, and he was a recovered heroin addict. And everybody kind of filed out. He said, hey, man, uh, where are you staying right now? I said, Ugh, here we go again. You know, I said, I, I might try to check into a shelter. I don't really have a place right now. And he said, look, if you can help me move in a week and a half, you can stay with me. And, uh, you know, I can at least help you out for about 10 days. Uh, so I had a shower that night. I put on some of his cologne that he had in the bathroom. He's like, you put on my cologne, didn't you? I said, yeah, sorry about that. He said, no, it's fine. And he gave me $10 for a burger. And I went up to a restaurant called Clark's and I had a burger and I was just in heaven. I was like, wow, this is the nice part of Chicago. This was North Side, Lincoln Park. And uh, yeah, so then I stayed with him for a bit. He moved to the Gold Coast. Uh, I stayed there for a few days. So probably more like two weeks altogether. And then I got a little place up in Uptown uh, down the street from 
the Green Mill, if anybody's familiar with Chicago or Uptown. There was a, a, a Christian commune down the street called Jesus People USA, and they would they offered me free meals and stuff, and I would go there and eat and and, and audition and just go through the trades and. I had my two little monologues prepared, so I would do those, and then eventually started booking some little plays, and then eventually uh, got an agent through a guy I met at the commune, uh, who was a fashion agent. He introduced me to a talent agent, and and then I got a part in a Carlsberg beer commercial, and then I got a a movie, and sort of back to back, and that was the whole Taft Hartley thing, I guess. So I love that. What do you recognize now in retrospect? Like, what would you, what would you know, Julian now? say maybe that julian then might have liked to have heard wow okay um yeah just keep hanging on just keep hanging on because it's going to get better and whatever's not good or doesn't seem good will will be great material for you down the road and will be if nothing else fuel for the fire and uh and will help uh shape you and uh teach you i think you know experience is a great teacher pain is a is a great teacher and suffering and um, comfort can be your worst enemy. And I think, I don't know, I mean, I think something in me sort of recognized that to be comfortable and to not really lay it all on the line and, and go for it, so to speak, would be, would be to waste an opportunity that I was afforded being that I was young. And of course, my parents lived in, in Montreal, but my father had a crazy upbringing in life. And I think he kind of I don't want to say relished, but I think he kind of appreciated the fact that I was struggling a bit and he definitely didn't want to, you know, give me any handouts. He, he, he realized that I needed to sort of, you know, uh, kick my way out of the, out of the shell, so to speak, you know, mm. and develop that, that wing strength, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Would you say that at the time, if there's so many different ways of perceiving your situation, right? I'm sure, it, I'm sure it varied, obviously. I mean, just like when you play characters, there's so many ways you can approach them. But would you say that the the sort of general tenor of your mood during that time and, and like the, the energy behind the fight, the stay, mm. the, the stay of the course, was that, what was that fueled by? Was that fueled by like, I know I can do this or was it, you know, kind of, mm. you know, I win, you lose system or whatever mm. it is, I'm going to get through. What was it? Like what? Uh, what... You ask really good questions. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I'm sure there, there was some aspect of it that was like, I'm going to make it, I'm going to do whatever it takes and I'll be, you know, seen or I'll be appreciated that in that sense, maybe that wasn't the, the healthiest motivation or whatever, but, um, but there was also just a belief I just had faith somehow that I had something that was worth offering and that people would appreciate. I just believed. I, I don't even know if I can fully explain how or why, but I just believed uh, that I would have success somehow. And looking back, I'm like, wow, that was really some sort of brazen faith because, you know, when I even – look at my you know pictures of myself let's say from back then or, or if i even if there if there's any tape on on me or uh anything that i did say early early in my career that i'm able to watch now i'm like wow like i was pretty green you know like as an as an actor as an artist um and probably i mean obviously as a person too so yeah i i think i think i just was hungry to sink my teeth into something and to express myself do you remember your your earliest experience of sort of thinking that acting was something you'd like to do? Yeah, I do. I do. So uh, my mom was a pianist. My mom's from London, and she went to the Royal Academy of uh, Music. So what happened was, um, you know, I was doing the piano lessons, and, and it was very a very classical kind of, uh, I guess you could say, rigid approach which didn't really work for me. And my mom was teaching me, which also didn't really work because I couldn't sit still, you know, with my mother. And she was a teacher. She would teach other people privately as well, piano. So there was a friend or a friend, an acquaintance who went to school, uh, my elementary school, and he was on a, on a Canadian TV show and he was somewhat of a little star. And, uh, and uh, I remember thinking that was really cool, you know, and he was an actor. And I thought, you know, I could, I could do that. Like, I can definitely do that. I could, 
I could sort of, you know, make believe and pretend and convince people. Uh, and um, so, yeah. So, so then, the, then uh, I told my mom, I was like, I'd like to do this children's theater thing because I want to act, you know? And so I started doing that children's theater of Montreal, uh, which was an old school company. Some of the alumni, this is how old it is. Christopher Plummer went there apparently as a kid, William Shatner went there. And so the people that started it were now, pretty elderly yeah so i started doing that and then and then they uh, re referred me to a, a dubbing house and i auditioned to dub a cartoon and i ended up booking that to be in this ensemble of little snowman it was called bully bully and we dubbed i dubbed that and then i got a, a lead in another project that was another kind of anime japanese thing and I, that was called bumpity boo and i did that and then it just and it just kind of went from there and then i ended up getting the the madeline thing and pepito and then madeline blew up when I was in Chicago, in fact, four or five years later, it Madeline was absolutely the rage. It was just crazy in the late nineties, and uh, but unfortunately, they bought me out. Sony bought me out, and I didn't get any any residuals whatsoever from the music. But I'm on it. I'm on it. Why <laughs> not? Yeah. So that that's kind of oh, that's cool. No, that's really interesting. Thank you for sh sharing that. Everyone is a different sort of you know reason for why they're doing it or how they found it and it sounds like you had it modeled early on which is really cool you saw that it was possible to be done right yeah, so yeah. that's really cool that you met that young young kid and go huh wow people can do that you know and until it was modeled that someone kind of you know can do it it's fun it, people miss that that opening right they're very closed it's really yeah. interesting so you, you're you're sort of tying it in and referring to the the boy that went to school with me yeah and the fact that he was successful yeah yeah and i was able to see that kind of sort of firsthand yeah yeah, yeah. and you were lucky yeah. that you had a parent yeah. that understands the arts so when yeah. if she didn't know i have any art she would go she'd probably think that was cute and interesting oh but maybe she wouldn't know what to do with it right yeah, but that, <laughs> she was really an artist good. oh you want it acting okay yeah that's really good and you know that's a great point and uh my mother uh, you know, her, her dream was to be a mother and, and to have a family. And so she was happy to, to, you know, be a music teacher in England at a school. And then after she met my dad, uh, to teach privately, she, she didn't have the, those, you know, intense ambitions to be like a superstar or whatever. Her brother, on the other hand, ha has made an, a tremendous career and he's a, he's a pretty well-known organist in England and he's, he's a composer and, and just a, a super brilliant and successful uh, musician in England. And so, yeah, there was that context where it, it wasn't like, sort of like, Oh, be careful, you know, like, I mean, yeah, be careful, but yeah, it's very much possible. You can do this if you apply yourself. And, you know, of course, if you keep your head screwed on straight, which was the kind of thing my dad would drill into me, who was, who was a stockbroker. So he, he was very, you know, he was like a numbers guy. Um, uh, a real academic type of guy, and I was super, super right brain, sort mm. of, you know, uh, you know, head in the clouds kind of artist. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you, you do, you kind of grow up just believing that, you know, it's possible to have a career, especially when you start, you know, booking jobs when you're quite young on yeah. cartoons, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm getting jobs, I'm making money, and well, yeah. it's fun, and I apparently I'm pretty good at it, and. Why not? You know, why not keep doing this? You know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And the, um, I was going to ask you, what what teased you back to L.A.? Because you were in Chicago doing oh, pretty a, well, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a, also a very good question. Yeah, I was doing OK in Chicago. Uh, what happened was I had gotten linked up with a wonderful group of people in Evanston. Uh, and it was uh, the Piven Theater Workshop with Byrne and Joyce Piven. Byrne and Joyce Piven became like, in a way, almost like adoptive, adoptive parents to me during the, this very uh, pivotal period of, of my time in, in Chicago. And I got involved with, with their workshop. I, he was letting me take classes, you know, for, uh, you know, for cheap or, or for nothing. I don't exactly remember, but he would always just, you know, make sure that I could attend the class. And I had an opportunity with the Steppenwolf Theater, which is a great theater company that Terry Kinney, John Malkovich, and Gary Sinise had founded in Chicago. And I remember, you know, reading plays in California when I was studying and going, wow, you know, I'd, I'd love to do a, I'd love to do something, you know, off Broadway or with the Steppenwolf Theater in Chicago, you know, and that was like a dream of mine to, to work 
with one of those guys. So there was a play that they were doing called One Flew Over the Cuckoo's, Cuckoo's Nest that was going to go to Broadway. And uh, I got this audition and I was so excited. I just really believed I was going to get this part. And uh, I did the audition, you know, and uh, I felt really good about it. I thought I really nailed it. When I walked out, a friend of mine also from Piven uh, was waiting to go in. Uh, this guy, Eric, and he was a he was a, a super actor. And uh, I went out to get in the elevator. And right then the elevator doors closed and there's John Malkovich in the elevator and the doors closed. And I was like, oh, man, this is this is going to be awesome. I'm going to be connected with these these uh, legends, you know, and I, I really thought I was going to get the part. Everybody seemed so happy. And, you know, and so I'm at an event at the Pivot Theater Workshop one night and Byrne tells me he's like, so uh, I guess they gave that role to Eric. And I was just crushed. I remember just listening and he didn't realize how invested I was in, you know, this dream of doing this play, but he knew I had auditioned for it, I guess. And, mm. and I just felt crushed. And in that moment, I remember thinking, that's it. I'm going back to LA. I'm going back to LA and I'm just going to go balls to the wall, you know, full speed ahead. And I'm going to, I'm going to just make it happen somehow. What stands out to me is that when you went back, your your passion was so re re energized yeah. after you didn't get the part. If if not actually really just affirmed, going no, this is how much I really want it. Is the how much I felt that. Yeah, and not only that I wanted it, but that I believed I would get it. You mm. know, so so when I, I love that. you know for two years was just, uh, you know, facing rejection after rejection and no after no after no you know, it, it tests your faith and it tests your resolve for sure. But it wasn't as though I hadn't experienced that before. You know, I had experienced that just process of going like, wow, where is this going? But I think one thing I really did have going for me was that I was quite young, which I guess, you know, looking back and looking on my back on my life or my career, I think has been a big part of my proce process has just been the importance, the vital importance of giving yourself room to fail and and to just, you know, go for it and and to understand that that's really all part of your education you know is taking risks going for it being willing to you know fall on your face so to speak um and understanding that that every one of those experiences is actually getting you closer to not necessarily only where you're supposed to be but to who you're supposed to be and to and to who maybe you already are but haven't you know uh, grown into yet. Fair enough. Also, what's interesting about that, maybe it's another conversation, is that you gave yourself to that sort of struggle. You were good at it. You were actually good at it. Like all these things, sleeping in the butt, you know, sleep, meeting the people, knocking on the door, sleeping yeah. in the daycare. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Right. You were good at that. But yeah, then, yeah. but you also knew, if I heard you correctly, that you were really good at acting. I believed that I was. I yeah. believed I was. That's you know? the sense I got, right? So yeah. it's, isn't it interesting that when that dream, that dream moment part where you thought, okay, you know, I'm, I ended up here because through all my series of things that I know that I can do. And now I'm really face to face with what I actually want mm. to do. And, and it didn't work. Not because you weren't good at it. Just as well, no, it's casting, right? But yeah. that, that, that made you go, I need to go to LA. <laughs> Yeah, to, to fail some more. I don't know. I don't know. There's something in there. Yeah. Like, to... well, yeah, to I don't know, to show them or something or to yeah. to prove something or whether whether to myself or to everyone else. But I think definitely everyone else was was involved, like wanting to to go, oh, OK, you, you know, you won't take me here. Well, you lost your chance because I'm out of here, you know, kind of thing. Mm. And I loved Chicago. I love, love Chicago. I, I still say it's one of my favorite cities in the world. And it's somewhere that even though I, I really didn't spend that much time there, yeah. um, it's, I would say it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those cities that's just sort of etched in my heart and, and maybe because that's where it, it all sort of started, at least as an adult, in my career. Totally. But uh, yeah. How are you yeah. defining success then? Do you think like, is, is there something that like in your brain or Something that when you got there, you you would know that you were starting that like I'll show you thing, or I am now starting to be successful. Was it a, was it a, yeah. a kind of gig oriented thing, or was it? Or do you remember the moment, like maybe your first milestone, where you were like, okay, yeah, totally. Uh, 
it 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 was steps you know it was it was getting a manager or getting an agent um getting a good audition you know driving onto the lot at warner brothers or or fox or universal uh, being there going into the room you know getting the material and going okay now i've got a pitch to hit you know i i just i was looking for pitches to hit and i knew i'd strike out a lot but i also felt like i had the potential to you know, to, to hit them over the fence. Yeah. So then when you, you'd get a call back for something, okay, okay, cool. You know, you feel that sense of momentum and then you just, whatever that, you know, drive it was already in me, it just sort of triggered a deeper hunger and a deeper desire to, to level, level up, you know, my yeah. game or, or, you know, my craft or just, um, to, to just, it was, it was about really having the opportunity to share something. I, and it's not even necessarily that I thought I was necessarily this like prodigious, like acting talent or anything like that. It was something I think that I just wanted badly to share of myself. It was like really personal, you know, it was like, I, I felt like there was something about me or in me that was enough to sort of, you know, get me over that ledge or that lip, you know, just to that next spot. Um, to get that traction. And, and I, I believe that, you know, I think I believed even, you know, then, but now definitely, uh, still that, you know, I don't even think the requirement is to, is to be the greatest craftsman, um, but to be interesting, but to be interesting, to be engaging and, and to give something of yourself, to be willing to offer something of yourself. And I think somehow in, intrinsically, I, I kind of understood that that they weren't necessarily looking for this technically perfect performance, but that they were looking for something real or something honest, which, which I remember when I was younger thinking when people would say, Oh, so you're an actor. So you're just really good at lying. I would take offense to that almost and say, no, it's, it's quite the opposite. I, I, I feel like acting is, is representing a heightened form of truth or a heightened version of the truth, something that, we have an opportunity like an ambassador to represent, but as, as an actor, as a performer, particularly in a medium where you have, you know, a platform, you, you can sort of be the ambassador for, for that, that aspect of humanity that's maybe not being heard or seen. And, and your responsibility is to tell the truth. So I think for me, success meant having that opportunity to, to dive in and to try to see you know, how far I could take my craft or, you know, what I could do and, and, and how, you know, how many people or, or institutions, if you will, would give me the chance to do that and the chance to share, um, share that part of myself um, through my, through my craft. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. That's exactly what, I mean, you've, you've succeeded because even with your email to me, I felt all of those things, all of those things that are screaming out as your values resonated even in the email you sent me. Wow, that's kind of amazing. I am I'm, I'm almost surprised to hear you say that because I was I'm not I'm not exactly aware of any of that, but I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you. Yeah. No, it, no, it's 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 absolutely true. The other thing that stood out to me is that when you went back to LA, you were ready. My god, the difference between you know, all this prep, which, you know, I see it literally as all of that was deliberate prep too. I know a lot of us say, oh, we learn along the way and we look back and we learn at our lessons. I would wager that you knew that that was your training and you were all into your training, which was all the stuff in Chicago, all mm -hmm. the, all the sleeping on, you know, you, so you were good. up for it, right? That's such a good way to put it. That's so true. I don't know if I've ever thought of it exactly that, that way, but I think that's really on point. I think what you're saying is, is true just you know passing through that valley uh as it were uh but yeah going through those challenges in chicago and coming out the other end yeah definitely definitely made me feel like okay i got this you know i can i i can definitely do this and and i was you know i was definitely driven and hungry yeah. uh, to prove that to to myself yeah yeah and others i guess you graduated. I mean, I literally feel like I get the sense that you graduated. You were commencing to the next thing. I mean, when you went back, you were like, I, I knew exactly what to do. Like, boom, 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 boom. Because I feel like 
I, I, again, I don't know you, but I feel like you do things when you know you're ready and you're that you're going to do them well. Though, right? You're getting to know me. I'm, I'm sharing a lot. <laughs> so. um, that I do think that's a really great point. Yeah. That I do things when I know I'm, I'm, I'm ready and it's time. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I think that's very, very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Super cool. Speaking of milestones, would you consider, would you consider where you're at now in your career with Three Pines as a milestone in your career? Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. So when Three Pines came up, you know, I did the audition and, and my agent wrote me an email and he said, if I was a betting man, you know, I'd, I'd bet on you. And I was like, wow, really? Okay, thanks. Like, you know, you get to the point where you're really just doing the auditions to appreciate the work and to share something. You're not even thinking necessarily like, oh, I could really book this. You, you just want to kind of work, you know, and get your teeth into something. So I liked the material. I did the audition. And then, and then it was a long time before I heard anything. And then they had me read for a different role. And then they came back to this role and it was all through zoom too and self tapes and zoom and which is which is weird when you're auditioning you know where's my eye line you know yeah. and uh and so i did the the final audition and i didn't that was on a thursday didn't hear the rest of the day thursday didn't hear friday nothing over the weekend which was normal didn't hear anything monday and i'm thinking oh this puppy's dead in the water i mean there's there's no way this thing's gonna you know this is too long you know mm -hmm. And then Tuesday, just after lunch, I got a call from my agent. He's like, hi, may I uh, speak to Mr. Peter Morrow, please? And I said, why, what? <laughs> so <laughs> so that, was, that was that. So yeah, absolutely. It's totally been a milestone for so many reasons. Yeah. Well, has anything surprised you about it? Well, I mean, I never would have thought that I would have had the best breakthrough of my career in my hometown where I grew up and felt like I had to get away from, you know? So I, yeah, I never would have thought that I, I would get that sort of breakthrough coming back here, but I, I guess there's a, there's a sort of poetic beauty to it in a way. And I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not to say it's all been smooth sailing up here, you know, I mean, it's, it's been challenging and it's been tough um, but it's it's all been you know humbling it's been humbling and and yeah surprising but rewarding and uh definitely uh growth inducing you know so i'm super grateful yeah what would you say that your biggest challenges are with the new success if if any <laughs> taxes believe it or not i've never really been in debt and uh, now i owe like a pretty penny to the government so <laughs> so that's kind of crazy but yeah that's the challenge um but you know that stuff I'll figure out money comes and goes, you know, hopefully comes more than it goes, but challenges, you know? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I would say to, to not necessarily try to try to think too much about it. It's kind of like, it's a thing you, you, you know, you pour yourself into and, and I'm very much a part of an ensemble, you know, um, and an incredible ensemble, this thing we all worked on has this life of its own and then you release it. But yeah, it's very much uh, an exercise in letting go and trusting and yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I it's, feel it's super, beautiful. super honored. Any, any artistic thing that involves collaboration, it should be a given that we're, we're, we're going to be honest or, or forthright about what we feel, what we think, what, what we're leaning towards and then ready to accept criticism or correction or somebody else to say, well, what about this? Have you thought of this? You know, to have that kind of, to go in low as it were, you know, to kind of go in low and say, well, wait a second. Now I think this would be cool, but, but I think that's the kind of stuff that, that creates the, the material that's like the glue that can make uh, an ensemble really sing. Mm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I love that too, because when, you know, it's conjuring up, not glue, like, like you're stuck together, like a mosaic, but rather a, mm. a tangible, malleable connectedness, yeah. right? Yeah, I was going to say malleable. Exactly. Yeah. It's know. beautiful. You know, when I asked the question, I think on the, on the forum, just for the listeners, the, the, what I asked was how true with one being not true at all and 10 being absolutely true. How true do you believe this principle to be? Life is a perfect adventure a game that cannot be won or lost, only played. And mm. Julian, you replied three. So mm. talk talk to me about how you came to that number. I find that really yeah. interesting, especially yeah. based on how we've been chatting. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because I, I kind of appreciated that question. I thought, wow, and it really made me think like, oof, maybe I think too much about this kind of question. But I guess in my mind, I think, I feel like it's possible to lose. And I think 
I think how we lose is is worth thinking about, you know, how, or how we could lose or how we might lose. And I, I do think that, you know, but just as humans, you know, the fact that we can make choices and yeah, we can learn from from bad choices, choices that maybe were we're going against that inner voice that that we that we know, like, don't go this way, you know, go, don't go down this road, you know, we can choose to ignore that voice. And I, I just think, I do think there's such a thing as as making good choices, or maybe, maybe healthy choices is a better way to put it. And I, of course, I, I've certainly not always made good or healthy choices. And, and you learn from them, hopefully, but you can also not learn from choices that you made that were not, you know, choices that that were true to yourself. You can, you can also not learn from them and, and you can find yourself like when you get in the water at the, in the ocean and you put your towel on your shoes and, and your umbrella down in the sand and then you get in the water and then you're just enjoying and you're kind of flopping around in there. And then you look up and you can't see your, your towel and your shoes and your umbrella anymore. And you're like, where is my stuff? And I think it's possible to lose yourself in a way that way, where there's a current or there's something that can pull you away from who you're truly meant to be or who, who you really are. And I know it's, it's kind of a harsh answer to say three on that question, but I, I do kind of feel like that that can happen. What's your definition of living in the moment? Oof. First thing that came to mind just was to not judge, to, just to sort of keep judgment at bay, you know, whether it's judging yourself or others or, or a situation or a feeling or something that's happening, to not be quick to like jump to a conclusion about what might be happening or what it means. That's the first thing that comes to mind is, is to not judge, but sort of to, to receive and to just mm-hmm. sort of go, okay, there's this, okay, that, you know, and uh, yeah. Mm, I love that. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. When when was the last time, most recent time in memory that you lived in the moment that you, that you felt like you were living in the moment? Can you can you recall one? Uh, well, I'm trying to do that right now with you. I'm trying mm. to be in the moment and just, you know, um, yeah. Uh, this morning I went for a walk and and I I just you know breathe and let the sun you know shine down on my face and uh and i just tried to you know stop thinking about about all the things i could be thinking about right now and Mm -hmm. um and just appreciate the present moment yeah Um, i love that i love that i feel that too i feel that we are in the moment it's interesting too because from my perspective you certainly um have have led from a very sort of well i would say adventurous from an outside perspective but now that I get to know you even with those details people would pin that and project that well that's a very adventurous brave life I could never do that I don't see that now now that I know you I'm like no that's his comfort zone that was his training that's that's a really interesting way to put it yeah Mm, and that's you you right yeah that's really good yeah that's good the adventurous uh to some people maybe but for me necessary and uh prerequisite almost you know yeah Yeah. it's part of your process yeah yeah for sure for sure it's beautiful no i feel that i really feel that how do you want to be remembered Mm. wow well i'd like to be remembered as somebody who was genuine and who loved and who was generous and who cared about people so i'm gonna ask you to put humility just to the side for a second Okay. Um, which is hard sometimes, right? Can be, yeah. Um, and just just ask you to tell me, beyond what is so obviously clear to people that only know you from the outside or from how you interact in the world or, or what your credits are. And I mean, you know, we could look it up and find out a lot of really cool, amazing things about you that say, you know, what your gifts are, right? Just based on some research. But what what do you think you bring? to the world, to the project, to the relationship, to the way that's unique to you. What are your gifts, your unique gifts? I hesitate to say unique, I guess, because hmm. I, I feel like a lot of people are, are probably, you know, share this, but I, I'm really, I, I really love the work and I, I really, I, I don't know, I guess passion, like passion for 
art or the arts or passion for reaching people through the art. I, I, I'm judging myself as I say that. I think, ah, oh, that sounds cheesy, you know, but I care. I care a lot about people. E empathy, maybe you could say empathy. Like I, I really, f maybe sometimes to a fault, you know, I, I feel things and I, I pick things up from people and it, it can, I have to sort of keep boundaries to a point to realize, okay, wait a second now, don't take this on your own shoulders because you're not meant to carry this other burden that this person's probably not even meant to carry for themselves you know but there there's just there, i really i really care about you know people and i i really want you know people to know that they're loved you know i don't know if that constitutes a a unique gift but i really have a desire for people to know that they're loved like everybody everybody um mm. is is really loved you know yeah um, I feel like no. a lot of people need to hear that and don't know that, you know, so. Can you finish this phrase? Most people think Julian Bailey is, but the truth is. Most people who know me maybe think I'm super competent, but the truth is while I am competent, I also am more critical of myself than I would like to be. And I'm, I'm more, uh, yeah, self-critical than I, than I think I am should be i think which is funny right to say i'm criticizing the fact that i'm self-critical but but uh but yeah yeah i think um i i i think you know judging from conversations i've had with people they think i come across as sometimes a bit aloof or sort of just and, and i'm really i'm really not meaning to i'm i'm really i care about you know people and i'm invested in that kind of thing okay what what's ahead for you like where do you see yourself 10 years from now well i would like to continue to work as an actor on projects that that are rich and 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 meaningful and able to be appreciated by a lot of people i i'd like to write more and have things that i've written be turned into things that again people can appreciate on a hopefully large scale I'd like to direct more that that's say just, you know, creatively um, on a more of a personal level, you know, I'd like to, to have a healthier, progressively healthier marriage and family life and uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to move around and to have the opportunity to, to share uh, with, with the world and, and with people, things that I think are, I have been given um, or blessed with the opportunity to to learn about and 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 therefore ultimately to share and, and impart. So so yeah, to be to to flourish and prosper like you know in my career, and in my family, and to let that that sp spring or that well or that field or you know um, produce a lot of fruit, and and to share that with with as many people as possible. Mm. Love it. If I may, there's something that comes to mind to ask you, which is, I'm really curious to know what younger Julian, mm -hmm. so not where you are now, so not present day Julian, but yeah. former Julian, who's still mm -hmm. with you, obviously, mm -hmm. might say what lessons he might give future Julian that you just Ooh. share oh. with us. Yeah. Okay. Is that is that the whole thing of... If I'd have known then what I know now, that is it kind of along those lines? We sometimes leave behind and, and we kind of look back and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I learned that lesson. And then that got me to where I am here. So you kind of leave that chunk behind. And then that got to me where it's here. And yeah. sometimes you can fall into a trap of like, yeah, but now I'm here. So that young adventurous guy that said yes to everything and slept in the yeah. park. Well, like I, I'm like, I'm in my forties now. Like I'm not going to do yeah. that. So like it becomes a limiting thing, but actually it's part of you that actually yeah. really helped you. So it's the yeah. opposite of a limiting belief, right? Limiting beliefs are things that worked that don't work for you anymore. Mm. But I also believe that there's an other side to that, which is that it worked before and, and in the present we think, therefore it won't work now. Like it's, we're, we work so hard on getting rid of limiting beliefs, but sometimes we also just limit the beliefs that actually could carry through and maybe look different in today, but use like, what can you, what can you mine? What can you excavate from earlier, Julian, that's going to help you get there? 
that is not going to be mm. like limited by saying, yeah, but you were young and fearless and you had your whole life ahead of you and you didn't care about sleep. I'm not saying you're going to sleep in the Y in order to become a director, or, you know, sleep on the floor or whatever. <laughs> Right. Yeah. But if that's what it takes, I mean, yeah. Well, and yeah. do you know what I mean though? Like the, yeah. we, when we bring in age, we, when we're further on our line, we start to sort of say, yeah, I used to do that. I can't do that anymore. And we, we yeah. limit ourselves based on what wow. we've proven we can do. Oh, that's a super interesting question. Um, yeah. Well, okay. Cause initially I was thinking like, you know, what would, what would, yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to get it, but yeah, let me try to answer your question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh you just know what just, do you think of it you know you don't even yeah. have to answer the question as it yeah. were like what is it bringing up for you yeah keep taking risks mm. keep taking risks uh keep believing against the odds like don't stop believing keep swinging you know and uh and and just keep putting one foot in front of the other you know um yeah um because initially I was, I was thinking of like what would knowing what i know now what would i encourage my younger self to do or to walk in more and i was thinking of things like you know really learn time management skills you know and really make it a, a practice of you know being in the best physical condition that you can be take your your nutrition really seriously you know take your sleep and getting up in good time seriously and don't don't have time leaks you know like that th those are some things that i think i still am, am, am learning to get better at you know it's yeah. like not not wasting time and little little bits here and there but to really think okay what's something that i can do right now this time that i have that would be productive and not just sort of you know killing time as they say you know mm. um and and that's something that i would like to be a lot better at is, is just making the most of of what I do have and judging it less, you know, being less critical of going, Oh, was this the right decision? And maybe I shouldn't have this and all of this. And well, why did I decide that? Oh, Cause now I'm here now. Like there, there, there has been some of that sort of, you know, back um, walla walla, as we say in the dubbing world, um, mm -hmm. kind of dialogue back dialogue going on sometimes where I'm just like, dude, stop. Like if you hadn't done this and then that and met that person and made that decision, very likely you wouldn't be right where you are now. And, and so just keep making the most of where you're at and doing what you can with what you have and be freaking grateful because, because uh, a lot of the, you know, the best things in life are, are not necessarily readily apparent at the outset and you have to kind of go digging for them a bit and, uh, and then just, you know, dust that, you know, that coal off those diamonds, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sound bite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. You're so sweet. You probably you probably wanted just wanted me to have that. You're probably giving it to me. You're so sweet. No, no, I'm not kidding. consciously I'm anyway. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I know. But All yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. I so appreciate you. Listen, I'm going yeah. to um give you the rapid fire. So I'm gonna say what makes you and I'm gonna say a word and you can Yeah, yeah. Can I just say something real, real quick though? Just yes. about that last bit that I said. Please. As a, after I said that and I thought to myself, well, I guess that has a lot to do with being in the moment, right? Is like, you know, just letting go of trying to figure it out or, or trying to, you know, analyze or get a, get a handle on how or why or even where things are right now. But just to go, we are here. It is this. And, uh, and just there's a there's a beauty in that you know what i mean and, and not necessarily sort of carving this perfect masterpiece of a life or of a path and in that sense maybe that has a lot to do with the idea of you know playing the game without necessarily this idea that you're that you're winning at it or losing at it and maybe maybe there's something there that i can dig into or explore a little more but anyway that just occurred to me so i, I wanted to throw that out there yeah that's that's um thank thank you for that no, I yeah. mean that's a huge insight. And actually you just you just uh taught me something. So thank you yeah. or reminded me of something that I okay, already yeah. know but that I needed reminding of. Yeah, cool. Which is is tempo and space. I mean my whole thing is about you know what I call the places where there are spaces, right? But the places where there are spaces, the moment before you step onto the stage. 
the mm. moment, you know, before, before they call places or cut, like I'm so, so interested in those spaces. And so yeah. you just, you just gave me, thank you. A reminder of yeah. just, just holding, continuing to hold the space and yay you for having the focus to, to say, hold on. I just had an insight, you know, and yeah. create, create that. And when we do Thanks. that, yeah. that's, that's what you're talking about with that collaboration, even when you're talking yeah. about with it, not being glue, but like, like you were able to, we have enough of a, a yeah. thing going here that you were able to say, Lisa, let's just stretch this a little further. No, so thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no, thank you. And I think there's a real joy in that, you know, and just the idea of, of going like, wow, yeah, the beauty in, in those in-between spaces, you know, and, and the beauty in just realizing stuff and going like, well, wait a second. Okay. I don't have to be in my head. Or I don't have to like worry or judge or look back in the past to try to untangle anything yeah. like it, it, it's just beautiful for what it is and and it's going to become something amazing if we let it now you know as opposed to sort of going like oh this is wrong in some way or broken in some way just go yeah. no there's something beautiful it's material it's fuel for the fire too you know mm. thank you for that all right are you ready yeah go for it okay yeah <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready, but I'll try. Again. All right. Try Did you ready. practice? No, 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 not at all. Like, <laughs> as I said, not at all. I was like, don't think about that stuff. Okay. It's right. okay to be a deer in headlights. Okay. So what makes you hungry? Not eating for a really long time. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, having a taste of success maybe also makes me hungry, like in a more of a metaphorical sense, you know, failing again in quotes, failing kind of makes me hungry. Like, ah, I want to. I want to get my teeth into something, you know, sink, dig my heels into something. What makes you sad? Oh, man. What makes me sad? Um, children who don't have a family. Yeah. What inspires you? People who don't quit. People who don't give up. What frustrates you? Losing things. Not being <laughs> able to find something. What makes you laugh? Well, I guess this is super on the nose, but like a really skilled comedian who's making a really great, you know, bit, who has a really great bit and just nails it. Um, that, you know, usually makes me laugh. Yeah. You think it's, is it things that like um, are surprising or is it, or is it things that are just timed perfectly? Yeah. Maybe a bit of both, you know, mm -hmm. maybe surprising, but also just like um, executed well. What makes you angry? <laughs> Oof, injustice. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Injustice. Yeah, totally. And finally, what are you grateful for? What makes you grateful? Oof, my children, uh, life, just life, uh, to be healthy. Um, food, to have food, to have a roof over my head. Um, uh, yeah, my, my wife, my family, um, my, my mom. Um, yeah, just to... Just to, just basic things, really, too. You know, a lot, a lot makes me grateful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Peace to have peace. You mm. know, makes me grateful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To have peace. I don't know if I always have. You know, and I'm sure none of us always have. But there's the, the value to have peace, just to have peace and to feel like, you know, that sense of like, yeah, that that's the most such a valuable thing. So I'm grateful for that. You know. Yeah. And to, yeah, that's, oh, that's one of those questions that makes you feel like, oh, there's so many things, you know, it's just like, I have so much to be grateful for, but yeah. 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 What are the, uh, what are the top three things that have happened so far today? Well, speaking with you, uh, definitely, you know, going for a little walk earlier, that was nice. And uh, yeah, just, just waking up with, with uh my son sleeping in the bed next to me because uh you know he's a bit under the weather so he slept in our bed last night and and waking up with with him you know next to me and then you know seeing my daughter coming in uh in the morning is always a treat you know because she comes in with a big smile and she's ready to ready to attack the day and so yeah both of those things and mm. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. A lot to be grateful for, for sure. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 What's something that you're looking forward to? I'm looking forward to 
uh, seeing my sister who's coming in from Australia. And I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully continuing on with the show. But uh, regardless of what happens with that, just people getting to appreciate uh, the rest of the season, which is uh, four more episodes yet to be released. And yeah, just just whatever momentum, you know, is contained in that. Looking forward to seeing where that where that goes. And um, yeah, just really, really happy to have had the opportunity and to have the opportunity to to work with such amazing people and on such meaningful material. And um, looking forward to seeing how that all unfolds. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Julian, it's been such a joy speaking with you, truly. Thank you so much for joining me today. All all mine. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, anytime. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. I've been speaking today with Julian Bailey. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. And remember to live in the moment. In music, stop time is that beautiful moment where the band is suspended in rhythmic unison, supporting the soloist to express their individuality. In the moment, I encourage you to take that time and create your own rhythm. Until next time, I'm Lisa Hopkins. Thanks for listening.